five years to date. It is still the all-time number one on that list of best-selling books. It has been translated into 35 different languages. It has sold over 10 million copies to date. And the title was this, A Brief History of Time from the Big Bang to Black Holes. Its author was a man by the name of Stephen Hawking, a man who is considered to be the greatest theoretical uh, physicist since Albert Einstein. Uh, he holds the Lucasian Chair of Mathematics at Cambridge University. That was a chair once held by Sir Isaac Newton. He's a, a genius in every scientific sense of the word. Uh, his secretary testifies that at one point in time, she dictated to him 46 pages full of notes covered with equations back to back, never put a single one in front of his face. And at one point in time, he backed up about 20 pages realizing that he had made a mistake on one equation. Brilliant man. Brilliant, brilliant man. His achievements are made even more impressive with the obstacle that he overcomes in his physical health. Uh, he suffers from Lou Gehrig's disease, ALS. Uh, he could not speak by the time that he wrote this book that I'm speaking of, uh, but he was given a computer synthesizer. He speaks through a voice synthesizer now. Uh, they have certain words and phrases on a quick pick list that he can pick from and, and string together other words if he so chooses. But he has hardly any movement in his body. And when they first configured the system, he triggered it all. He ran the whole system by the small movement he had left in one finger of one hand, which he could move one millimeter. And that's how he talked. He lost that movement in 2005 and they reconfigured the system he now speaks by the movement in a single cheek muscle incredible they have a backup system should that movement ever cease to be available to him which will shoot infrared light into his eye and will be able to uh, gather the blinks of an eye and he'll be able to continue to communicate absolutely astounding it's, it's, it's incredible really and what a man then to answer this question is man determined? Is man designed? Are, are we put together? Was there some purpose in our making? Is there anything to indicate the mark of a creator in us? And when he was asked to speak on this topic in the 1990s, I want to give you his response to that question. Stephen Hawking said, yes, my conclusion is that we have been designed, but since we do not know that design, we may have well not have been. That was his conclusion. He added to that answer that his major concern for mankind was that since in his estimation we are products of natural selection, of the process of evolution which is propelled by aggression and by the, uh, the winning out of the stronger, he said his fear for mankind and his hope was that soon, sometimes within the next 100 years, we would find a way to travel and disperse to all the various planets nearby so that not one single atrocity would wipe out humankind altogether. And all this from the most brilliant scientific mind of our day. It was Malcolm Muggeridge who said, we have educated ourselves into imbecility. It was G.K. Chesterton who said, it was after I read The Atheists that I was led to Jesus Christ. The festering sore in the heart of paganism was the lack of certainty that life has any meaning or value. And I think we have seen this multiplied about a hundred times over in the, rest, the recent rise of secularism in our country. For what meaning or for what purpose were you created? Why are you here? Uh, Hawking says you may have been created, but you might as well have not been and as far as meaning goes, you either have none or you're going to have to come up with it on your own. And, and I can tell you personally, as we walked the streets of Rockville, Maryland, we had a survey that we used to try to get conversation going. And we talked to many, many different people of many, many different worldviews. And the survey always ended with this question. If you could ask God one question, and if we were speaking to agnostic or an atheist, just pretend just pretend he's up there and he's listening. If you could ask God one question, what would it be? 
And the number one answer that I heard over and over again, especially from the minds of young skeptics and, and young seekers, was this. What is my purpose? I would ask God, why did you put me here? Over and over and over again we heard it. And they've broken free from the so-called shackles of religion only to realize that they've cut loose of their own moorings and they drift away in their own self-made prison of meaningless. What is my purpose? What is my meaning? I want to turn with you to Psalm chapter 8 and several other writings within our Bible and seek the Word of God out to see if we can find an answer to this question. What is my meaning? What is the purpose? And if you want to go to Psalm 8, it's not that long of a song. Uh, let's read the whole thing in its entirety. Psalm 8. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babies and infants you have established strength because of your foes to steal the enemy and the avenger. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him? Yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. You have given him dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens and the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the sea. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. And also let's go to two writings of the Apostle Paul. First off in, in Romans chapter 8, he says this, We know, we know that for those who love the Lord, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. And lastly, let us look to Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4, beginning. Even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him, in love he predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the beloved. Here, implicitly and explicitly, is stated the purpose of God. Here is our purpose that he bestowed upon us. You have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings. Some translations say you have made him a little lower than the angels. However, we get that translation from the Septuagint, that Greek translation of the Old Testament. If you look to the Hebrew, the word there is Elohim. You have made him a little lower than God, the New Revised Standard reads. Some commentators even say this. It is appropriate to read this. You have made him with just a little bit of God lacking in him. And then we move to Romans chapter 8 and Ephesians chapter 1. We get such a beautiful insight. He predestined us to be conformed to the image of God, the image of His Son, rather, for the praise of His glory. These both move me to the approach that I want to take to this evening as we consider our purpose. I believe we will find our purpose in the person of Jesus Christ, that one who bridged His heavenly mission with His earthly journey because he, it was intended that His journey be the first of many to follow. He was the firstborn among many brethren, and so if you are to find your meaning and your purpose this evening, it is my assertion that you will only find it in the person of Jesus Christ. Just a quick review of the cultures that were in play at the time of Christ's appearing, I think will, will show to us how we find our purpose in Jesus Christ. We had the Hebrew culture, we had the Greek culture, and we had the Roman culture. Where did they look for meaning? Where did they look for purpose? Well, the main pursuit of the Hebrews was light. Uh, in Psalm 27 and verse 1, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Psalm 119 and 105, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Isaiah 9 and verse 2, the pursuit of the Hebrew was light. The pursuit of the Greek was knowledge. 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 22, Paul says, the Greeks seek after wisdom. In Acts chapter 17, you remember where Paul went to the Areopagus and Luke testifies that people gathered there looking for some new thing to talk about. The university, the scholar, the philosopher, all of these were central to Greek culture 
and the Greek pursued wisdom. The pursuit of the Roman was glory. Uh, Nothing had ever matched the glory of Rome. Nothing matched the splendor of that great city. We know it was not built in a day, and all roads led to it. The pursuit of the Roman was glory. The Hebrews pursuing light, the Greeks pursuing wisdom, the Romans pursuing glory. And the Apostle Paul writes in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 6, For God who said, Let light shine out of the darkness, has shown into our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Where will I find meaning in this life? Paul, writing by inspiration, he knew that these three cultures would give three different answers. You'll find it in light. No, you'll find it in knowledge. No, you'll find it in glory. You find all three in the face of Jesus Christ. John chapter 17, Jesus prays that high priestly prayer. And he prays for himself, and then he prays for his disciples, and then he prays for everybody else who's going to come after that. He says in verse 4, I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. I fulfilled my purpose, in other words. As you read through this chapter, one thing strikes me, the way that Jesus uses this address over and over again, Father, Father, Father. Verse 11, uh, he gives us this, Holy Father, We're not orphans in this world. Uh, Contrary to what Stephen Hawking might say, contrary to what our secular society might say, we are fashioned as children of a holy father for a purpose. And realize what we hear in that very address there, holy father, holy, that which makes him so different and distinct, father, that which brings him so near. The first purpose that I want to talk about tonight, and we'll talk about three, but the first purpose of humanity that we see in Jesus Christ is that God created us for sonship. God created us, number one, for sonship. God wanted to tell us who He was, and so He sent us a son. Why? He wanted us to know how to relate to Him. We are to relate to Him as sons. And as we examine the face of Jesus Christ, we see in this form of address, Holy Father, Righteous Father, the Sonship of Jesus Christ. You know, one of the only things that I regret about having five children is that I never have the time or the energy to give them all of the time and energy that that, that, that they need, that they require, that I would like to give to them. Uh, They've always got something to show. You know, Daddy, Daddy, you just got to see, you've got to see this. And, and it's some new configuration of Legos or, or some collection of hickory nuts or some crayon drawing of a flag. You've got to see it, though. Uh, Daddy, Daddy, did you, did you see me do that? Did you see me do that? And it's the, the 50th time that they jumped in the pool or they made a bubble in the tub or they think they've broke their previous land speed record. you just got to see, did you see me do that? But what is that? What, what is happening there you know we've all been to that stereotypical elementary school program where they're up there singing and then they're you know they're they're craning their necks looking around the auditorium where is mom where is dad and after the show did you see me did you see me and i, I want to say yes of, of course i saw you singing that same lee greenwood song they've used since the 1990s and and you forgot half the words and i think your zipper was unzipped And yes, I still cried. What is that? There's a peculiar kind of love that's exhibited in the bonds of sonship where the son gains sheer joy from nothing more than pleasing the father. And likewise, the father gains pure, unadulterated joy from nothing more than these imperfect and amateur offerings that are offered up in love of the son. And we were created for sonship, purpose number one, to draw pleasure from nothing more than dwelling in the bonds of love with your father, seeking his face with that, that burning question, how did I do that time, father? How did I do? Did you see me? Purpose number two, worship. You were created for worship. 
you know, realize in the secular world, they give you these tiny little meanings with no ultimate meaning, tiny little purposes with no ultimate purpose. There, there's no skin for life in that. Life has nothing that holds it all together. It's so fragmented. And so you get these momentary little meanings with these momentary little purposes, but no ultimate meaning and no ultimate purpose. One of the most beautiful things about worship is that worship provides a skin for life. You know, worship is coextensive with life. And we're aware that God's church should exist within His people, the temple in which the Holy Spirit dwells. It is in our bodies. And when we gather for corporate worship on the Lord's Day, we know that we are assembly of what was already called worshipers. Because the worship sets the very framework for the meaning of life. We're a people of prayer. That's who we are. We are a giving people. That's who we are. We're a people with a song on our heart. That's who we are. We're a people who are guided by the word. We're a people who live under the shadow of the Lord's death until he comes. That's who we are. And, and worship gives us that skin for life and that meaning and that purpose. Have you ever thought of what the existentialist lives for, that pleasure seeker? Well, it's the here and now. It's, it's all about what pleasure can I gain for myself today for tomorrow I die. What about the utopian? What does he live for? Well, pie in the sky, by and by, when I die, it's all about the future. Or you have those who look to the past as the, the Hebrew does. I, I know Brother Rick likes to quote Fiddler on the Roof. What, what holds us all together? Tradition, tradition, tradition. You have people living for the past, people living for the present, people living for the future. And when Paul gives his instruction concerning the Lord's Supper, what does he say? 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 26. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, present, you proclaim the Lord's death, past, until he comes, future. Worship fuses every point in life together. It binds it all, gives it cohesiveness. And the act which is built as that which gives service to God actually serves also as a tool for reorienting us and reminding us of our purpose. You were created for sonship, number one. You were created for worship, number two. And lastly, number three, you were created for stewardship. Genesis chapter one. Man was hot off the assembly line when we hear the first word spoken from God to man. Verse 28, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Subdue. Have dominion. I've created you to be over all the rest of it. And, and God creates man as his chief operating officer, as it were, to run the show here on this earth. Now, our world, our secular world today, pretends to have constructed some substitutes for the Christian idea of stewardship of God's creation. Uh, and, and it pretends to do just as well or even better, you know, with these green movements and environmental projects. But so often the focus is so skewed. You have so many, a la Romans chapter 1, who are serving the creature rather than the creator. And they're promoting earth and animal as being just the same as humankind. Uh, you have this idea floating out there that there really is no difference between man and woman. And in most cases, you have both sexes trying to be the man. Uh, it was Carl Stern who, who talked about uh, the flight from woman in our culture. I love his quote. Listen to this. He says, We extol action over contemplation, doing over being, analysis over intuition, problems over mysteries, success over contentment, conquering over nurturing, the quick fix over lifelong commitment, the prostitute over the mother. And I believe what we see in the feminist movement is not at all a push to respect woman as woman, but rather the eradication of the true nature of womanhood coupled with the illegitimate, illegitimate claim that women should be respected as men. It's not a push to respect women at all. And I would remind us of what the text actually said there in Genesis 1 and verse 28. Go back up. What did he say? And God blessed them. And God said to them be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion. From the very beginning, stewardship and dominion was given to man and woman jointly as God knew for sure that, that we weren't to do it and that we could not do it alone. It was God who placed within man that distinctive strength and who placed within woman that distinctive charm. And he said to both at once, both of you, 
go have dominion. If we are to fulfill our purpose as stewards of God, it will be necessary to call on us to respect women as women and to respect men as men. It's baked into our purpose. And so what is our purpose? We were created for sonship. We were created for worship. We were created for stewardship. We find our sonship and our worship and our stewardship in Him. Uh, Remember that undergirding sonship as love, uh, undergirding worship is reverence, undergirding stewardship is accountability, and and when you take these three, love, reverence, and accountability, the words of Augustine ring more true than ever. He said, you have made us for yourself, and our hearts are restless until they find their rest in thee. We were created for a purpose, and that purpose is completely bound up in God our Father, who made us because he loved us. And then one thing remains. Well done, thy good and faithful servant. That day that we get to look back and say, how did you like that, Father? Did you see me? Did you see me? For every